light, reflection, and refraction. So waves transfer energy. Remember that the particles vibrate in place and the energy is moved away from the source. Mechanical waves require a material in which to move through. Sound waves are an example of this. However, light, is a, which is also known as an electromagnetic wave, are non-mechanical. They don't require a medium. This is the reason why we can get light from the sun. Light travels faster than sound, which is the reason why when we have lightning and thunder, we actually see the lightning before we hear the thunder. So what is an electromagnetic wave or a light wave? It is a transverse wave where the molecules vibrate up and down, up and down, up and down, and the energy moves out perpendicular to this. An electromagnetic wave consists of an electric field and a magnetic field that are doing this at right angles to each other. So you have your electric field that is going up and down, up and down, and it is a transverse wave. The energy is moving perpendicular to the molecules, to the particles, and the same thing happens with the magnetic field, and that electric field and magnetic field are perpendicular to one another. We can see that in this small video. Here you can see is moving up and down and it's a transverse wave and the energy is propagating perpendicular to the particle motion and the same things happening with the magnetic field and they move at right angles to each other so we have what is called an electromagnetic spectrum, and there's a bunch of range of wavelengths that are included in the electromagnetic spectrum, and a lot of the electromagnetic spectrum we cannot actually see. And this ranges from radio waves all the way to gamma. Radio waves have a very long, long wavelength, and as a result have a very low frequency. Gamma rays have a very short wavelength and a very, very high frequency. Now there is a portion of the spectrum we can see, and that's known as visible light. And this allows us to have different colors. And the colors of the electromagnetic spectrum are Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Now when we add all these colors together, we get white light. So here you can see the electromagnetic spectrum. And again, radio waves have a very long wavelength and a very low frequency. And red is the color of visible light that has the longest wavelength and the lowest frequency. So one way to remember this is radio and red are long and low. So radio in the entire spectrum has the longest wavelength and the lowest frequency. And red in the visible portion of the spectrum would have the longest wavelength and the lowest frequency. Gamma is on the opposite end and it has the short wavelength and the highest frequency. So which type of wave is used in your cell phone? Believe it or not, it's actually microwaves, which does lead to the question, how good is it for the cell phone to be next to your ears or around us in the way that it is. This is the reason why scientists are doing a lot of research on the impact of the radio of the microwaves that are produced by the cell phone. Which type of waves are used in the medical field? Now, a lot of people like to say that it's X-ray, and that is true. And in some medical fields, they also use um, UV light to help disinfect and kill off germs in the workplace. Which type of wave is the most dangerous? Well, that's going to be gamma rays. Not to mention anything about Hulk or anything, but gamma seems pretty dangerous. So which type of wave is used in our TV? That's actually radio FM. 
Again, remember that radio waves are light waves. And how we hear this is by using an electromagnet to convert the electromagnetic wave into a sound wave. Which type of wave is given off by heat lamps? And this is going to be infrared. In fact, we produce infrared, and so sometimes um, people will use infrared goggles to detect individuals in the dark. Which type of wave can give you a sunburn? That's ultraviolet, and so using sunscreen can help with the ultraviolet radiation. So let's look at reflection. Reflection is actually the bouncing back of a wave of light off of a reflecting surface, usually a mirror. And so if it's a smooth surface, here you're going to see that the incident ray, or the ray that's incoming, comes off and reflects off of the, of the mirror, or smooth surface. And we have a line that's called the normal line, which is perpendicular to the, that surface. Now, all angles are measured with respect to the normal line. So one of the things you'll notice here is the angle that is made between the incident or incoming ray of light and the normal line is called the angle of incident. And the reflected ray makes an angle with that normal line, and we call that the angle of reflection. Now what you'll notice is that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection when measured with respect to that normal line or that perpendicular line. And this is called the law of reflection. The angle of incidence or incoming angle is equal to the angle of reflection or reflected angle. We actually use the law of reflection in many, many ways, just not necessarily always with light. If you've ever used a backboard when playing basketball, you have actually used the law of reflection. If you're playing pool and you have a cue ball, you might actually use the edges to bank the shot and to use the law of reflection so you know what angle it comes off of and again, that's with respect to the perpendicular. This is also useful if you're playing wall ball or many other types of activities. You can use the law of reflection to your benefit. So again, a few key elements that we have to know about. The normal line, which is perpendicular to the surface. The ray of incidence or incident ray is the, is the ray or the line that's coming in of light, incident on the mirror. You have the reflected ray, which is the ray that is outgoing or going away from the mirror. You have the angle of incidence, which is the angle that's made between the incident ray or incoming ray and the normal. And then you have the angle of reflection, which is the angle made between the reflected ray and the normal. And the law of reflection states that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So what happens if it's a rough surface? Believe it or not, it still holds the law of reflection. So if you were to actually draw the normal lines here, you'd actually see that it's still, the angle of incidence is still equal to the angle of reflection. It still obeys the law. The deal is that the normal lines are not parallel to each other. They're not straight vertical because the surface isn't smooth. And so it doesn't seem like it would be obeying the law. Now diffuse reflection is actually when the light scatters or spreads out. This actually happens quite often when we're referring to particles that are suspended in air, such as on a foggy day. And when that happens, if you use your high beams, what you'll notice is the light diffuses out everywhere. And not only does it make it harder for you to see, but it makes it harder for people to see you as well. And this is called diffuse. The light actually diffuses or reflects in a diffuse or spread out pattern off of the particles. And again, it's still obeying the law of reflection, but the 
normal lines are not parallel to one another. And so it doesn't seem like it's obeying that law. Whereas on a smooth surface, you would notice that if you drew the normal lines, those normal lines would be perpendicular to that surface and straight parallel to one another. This allows all of the incident light to reflect off parallel to each other as well. Now, if it's a smooth surface, we're going to call it specular or regular reflection. This is the one we're most familiar with. Whereas if it is a rough surface, we call it diffuse reflection. And one way we actually um, are able to determine if something is smooth is we're looking for that specular reflection off the surface. If it's not smooth, then it's not going to have that specular type of reflection. And this is kind of how a lot of times they'll know if a contact is actually smooth or if there's something actually on top of the contact or the lens of a glass. You want to make sure that glasses are nice and smooth. So they use this to kind of help determine if the surface is smoothed all the way and ready to be able to be given to um, the owner of the contacts or the owner of the glasses. So what about flat mirrors? We also look at flat mirrors or plane mirrors. They're called plane mirrors or flat mirrors. What happens when we look in a plane mirror or flat mirror? Well, your image appears upright. It doesn't appear inverted or upside down. You don't look like you're standing on your head and standing on your head, that would look inverted. That's what inverted means. Um, you also look the exact same size. So if you are looking at a plane mirror, your size has not changed. You look identical. Your image looks identical to you. And however far you are from the mirror, the image appears from the mirror. So you look the same distance from that mirror. However, when you raise your right hand, you'll notice that the image looks like it's raising its left hand. And so the image appears backward. This is the reason why you could actually write a message and uh, hold it up in the mirror and be able to read it correctly if you had written it backward. And this is also the reason why um, they used to put the word ambulance written backward um, on the front of an ambulance so that when people were driving along and they looked in their rear view mirror, you could actually see the word ambulance correctly written. Um, nowadays, they've kind of stopped writing ambulance backward on the front of an ambulance, figuring that most people know what an ambulance looks like, but they did actually do that. Um, so if you ever look through some pictures and you see the word ambulance backward, on the front of an ambulance that was actually intended that way. That's not a mistake. It's actually that way so that when we look in a rear view mirror, we could see the word ambulance correctly. Another word um, that is important when describing your image is that it's virtual. Rays don't actually pass through the mirror, but your image is on the other side of the mirror. And that's called a virtual image. It's where the rays do not actually pass, and so it's more of a projection um, of where that image would be. And this is called virtual. Whereas if the light actually does go there and an image is formed, that's called a real image. Virtual images cannot be formed on a screen. So as much as we try, if you're looking at yourself in a mirror, you actually are not able to project onto a screen that image. The only way to actually be able to view it is by using a by using your eyeball or actually a camera in and of itself. So it actually cannot be projected onto a screen without actually taking the image through a camera or through an eyeball in order to make that kind of process happen. So your image looks exactly like you. Um, the image is the same distance from the mirror as you are. And so if you're if you are standing two meters from the mirror, your image is two meters from the mirror, which would make your image a total of four meters from you. So let me repeat that. If you're two meters from the mirror, then your image is two meters from the mirror. That means that your image is four meters from you. Now, your image is going to appear to move at the same speed you're moving. And so basically your image is actually just like you.
Now, not all mirrors are flat. We do actually have mirrors that are caved, uh, curved. And so a concave mirror is a mirror where the image um, is formed and it's actually a concave mirror. It looks like you can walk into it. It's kind of like a cave or a curvature where it um, looks like you could walk into that. And so it's curved in. And if you actually were to go look at a spoon, this is the side of the spoon that you would scoop your ice cream or your yogurt or your soup into. And this is actually gonna make you look often taller and thinner. That's my kind of mirror. Woo, I am short and I could use some tall and thin for sure. So a second type of mirror is known as a convex mirror and this is caved outward. This is the back side of a spoon. And this is also the, the type that you might see on the side mirror of a car. Whereas the concave is actually used to help focus your headlamp. So if you think about a concave mirror, the concave mirror is often used to focus headlamps and cause the light to converge or come together. With the convex mirror, it actually divides the light or spreads it out. And you would actually see this in the side mirror of your car. This also, because it divides or spreads out the light, it also makes you look a little bit short and fat. And I could uh, use without this because I'm short enough without this type of mirror. So these mirrors are often useful in everyday life. Um, obviously, that's also some fun Unique applications would be a fun house where you can have a fun house mirror and be able to see yourself and make yourself look different. So now we're going to watch a little bit of a video regarding concave and convex mirrors and how they're utilized. Convex and concave mirrors can be just as useful as lenses, solving many of the same problems. Let me show you how they work. Convex mirrors reflect light outward, resulting in an image that will always appear upright and smaller. You may have seen these kind of mirrors in a fun house. Here, the vertical is undistorted, making the horizontal view skinnier. Concave mirrors reflect light inward and can be used to focus that light. The focus light can be used to generate heat. A concave mirror can also be used to project an image. Notice that this image is always upside down, and because it's formed in the real world, we call it a real image. When the object is within the focal point of the mirror, the image in the mirror appears upright and magnified. Perhaps one of the most important uses of a concave mirror is the reflecting telescope. Not only do these telescopes provide high magnification, but they also solve a major problem that all lenses have. When light passes through a lens, there will always be a dispersion of colors, the prism effect. This can cause a blurriness, which is hard to correct for, it is called chromatic aberration. Mirrors don't have this problem. Therefore, these days, most of the best telescopes are using concave mirrors rather than lenses. These include Caltech's Palomar telescope, the Keck telescope in Hawaii, and the famous Hubble telescope orbiting the Earth in outer space. And here's another really great use um, where we can actually create a hologram type of situation using these types of mirrors.
Do you see a frog there? It looks like it's sitting on glass. Is he there? Oh, technical difficulties here. Let's try that again. Do you see a frog there? It looks like it's sitting on glass. Is he there? No. I cannot pick him up. Where is the frog? He's in the mirror scope. See the mirrors? Double mirrors. That's the secret. Creates a hologram. Now let's try a penny. See a penny there? I can poke my finger right through it. You can buy this item at a very low price on eBay under old cartoon comics. Look for my link. You can So what about refraction of light? Refraction of light is the bending of light when it passes between the boundary between two different materials. So as you pass from air to water or, um, and back and forth between two different substances, you're going to find that light bends. And so some of it might reflect off the surface, but then some of it bends through the surface as well. And this is called refraction. So the bending of light occurs as it passes from one substance into another. And part of this is because light actually travels slower in liquids and solids. So light, as it passes from air into a liquid or air into a, a solid, it's actually going to slow down. And because it's slowing down, it's not able to move as fast, and so it's not moving as far. You may have seen this if you've ever held a prism in your hand or if you've looked at a diamond ring, light actually will bend. And if you've ever been to a jewelry store, you might know that they're actually looking not only for the label that sometimes are put inside of the diamonds, looking at the clarity, but they're also looking to see if it's cubic zirconia versus diamond. The angle of refraction is going to be much, much smaller in diamond than it would in cubic zirconia. And so you're going to get a smaller angle of refraction or smaller bending because diamond slows the light down that much more compared to cubic zirconia. So while there's a number of things that they might be looking at, this is also one that they would look at as well. So what you'll notice is that as light passes from a less dense substance such as air into a more dense substance like glass, the distance between the wave fronts decreases. And this has to do with the fact that it's slowing down. Whereas if it was moving from a more dense material into a less dense material, then it would be able to speed up. And so the wavelength would be greater if it was speeding up, whereas the wavelength is smaller as it slows down. So as light moves from a medium where it's moving faster into something that it's moving slower, the wave fronts are closer together and the ray of light is not able to bend as far and so it actually is going to be closer to the normal line, that perpendicular line that we measure all our angles from. The opposite is true if we go from something that is more dense to something less dense. If we move from something where we're moving at a slower speed to something that we're moving at a higher speed, as we're able to go faster, we're going to have the wave fronts further and further apart and the angle made between the normal and the refracted ray would be greater. So the ray bends away because we're going faster so we can move further. 
Now, light travels fastest in a vacuum. So again, remember that when you're moving into air or the less dense a substance is, the faster that it's going to be able to move. The more dense a substance is, the slower it's going to move. Here's a short clip that can show you how this process works. Notice that the angle of incidence is going to be greater than the angle of refraction. So here's a kind of type of glass block getting lined up. And now we're going to shine the light on it. Now, when it's at exactly the normal line, you'll notice that there is no angle. And you'll notice that at five degrees, you're going to see that there's a slight bending and the refracted is just, just less than five. At 10, you'll notice that it's significantly less than 10. At 15 degrees, you're going to notice the refracted angle is 10 degrees. So you'll notice that the light is slowing down because it's moving into a more dense material. And so the angle of incidence here is actually going to be far greater than the angle that is refracted. And again, notice these angles are measured with respect to the normal line. Now you may have ever seen this, if you've ever actually seen a penny in a wishing well, light has bent. Or if you've ever tried to catch a fish in a tank, not only is it hard to catch the fish because the fish is a little bit slimy and a little bit slick and can move pretty quick, but also because light bends. And so things don't appear the way they are. So if you have the opportunity, go get a glass of water, go get a pen or a pencil, and take that and put a little bit of water in there and look at the boundary between the two media. When the pencil or pen is placed in the center, you'll notice that it looks magnified at the bottom. If you move it off to the side, as you move it off to the side, you'll notice that the pencil's starting to look broken. And then when you move it all the way to the side, the pencil looks like it's broken, but the pencil is actually not broken at all. Neither is the pen when you do this. It's because light bends. This is also the reason why if you're trying to catch, the, catch somebody's attention and you're on the beach or in a swimming pool, it's probably not the best idea to stand there with only a fraction of your body in the water. This actually makes you look very short in comparison to your actual height. And so if you're wanting to make yourself look long, a little bit taller, you might not want to stand there with just a little bit of your body in the water. At least for me, this is not a good idea because I'm pretty short already. And that's information about light reflection and refraction and the light basics.